let's talk about watches. Okay, on a more cheerful note, George Kern, CEO of Breitling, but a very dear friend who I've, I've known now the better part of two decades. And one of the guys that I, uh, I love the most in the watch industry because he's an innovator. And George, how are you, first of all? I'm great, thank you very much. Um, all good, thank God in um, uh, Switzerland, we don't have a super strict uh, confinement, so I can still go cycling. No. Oh. Or if I cycle, I'm so quick that the guys behind me are hundreds of meters, not two meters uh, behind me, but hundreds of meters. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, George is referring to the fact that we're both big fans of cycling. Uh, I have the great pleasure of cycling on George's team. Many years ago, uh, when he was the CEO of IWC, um, he was sponsoring an event called Fautour, uh, which is not uh, 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 not incorrect in terms of what it actually felt like to experience it. It really <laughs> felt like torture. It is a 2,000 kilometer nonstop race around Switzerland. And then I remember, um, <laughs> and it was a race full of mishaps for me. I fell off my bicycle in the prologue. I ended up cycling on the highway in Zurich or in Switzerland, which apparently people get very upset about because uh, they were cursing at me on the highway. And then when I was trying to go back, they were still cursing at me. And then, um, <laughs> Uh, oh yes, and then George, very sweetly, uh, during one of the, so the solo stages, gave me one of the stages with the greatest elevations because I had explained to him I live in a completely flat country called Singapore. And then George told me it, it, with a very straight face, he said, Way, you know, when I give you this, this stage, I give you a great gift. And I said, George, what's that? He says, I give you the, the great gift of very entertaining dinnertime conversation if you survive. And <laughs> which I barely did. And, 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 and way you wrote, you wrote one of the most funniest articles ever, which I still have at home, and uh, which I read here and there, which is which was brilliant, absolutely brilliant when you described the whole uh, the whole story. It was brilliant. I loved it. Amazing. Well, thank you, George. Now, George, I have to also commend you on something uh, because I think you are the first watch CEO of all time to ever receive a direct compliment from Shame on Wrist. <laughs> it was incredible. I was looking at the picture of the, the British Racing Green, um, a Breitling chronomat that you posted with this magnificent Hulot bracelet. And I was looking through and I would say 99% of the comments were favorable. In fact, not, I would say 80% of them were extremely good. The rest were favorable and there was you know, maybe one or two guys. And then suddenly Shame on Wrist pops up and you're always wondering what is this man gonna say? And I think he said something along the lines of like, great job, you nailed it on the bracelet. And those of us who are looking at this, were so shocked. Like we had, like, it couldn't believe it. Shame on Risk, who's the guy who normally hates everything, but is very funny. Uh, I really wonder, I really want to find out who this guy is or this girl. <laughs> and um, it's incredible. But how does it feel that the world's biggest critic loves your watch? It's, it's an honor, but indeed what you said, uh, what is even more important that 99% of uh, the reactions we, we got are, are incredibly positive. And um, of course it's super reassuring because we've presented the product also to the retailers uh, before coronavirus and, and, and uh, and uh, in the countries which were open. So we had also very good feedback from the retailers. Everybody's extremely uh, confident. But now the reaction of, in a way, the consumers um, is, is quite amazing. As you know, that 70, that the, the, the decision process, the buying pro, uh, decision process is made online up to 70%, while then the physical purchasing act is different. It's, it's uh, uh, it's omnichannel, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the product had a phenomenal imp impact, and and we worked on it since two years. And I have an amazing designer, uh, Sylvain uh, Bernon, uh, who did an excellent job, and it was a fantastic project. And I'm very happy. Uh, I think this can be uh, a huge classic and icon in the industry. Yeah, I think you really nailed it, uh, George. I think it's, it's just a, such a cool looking watch. Perfect size at 42, you know. Um, it, and it, you know, the funny thing is that there's been so little energy in place in bracelets in the last decade or so. And for you to come up with this Rula bracelet, but to make a kind of even more modern and more comfortable and more pragmatic interpretation of that, 
was great. There's so much goodwill for the chronomat. My, my first watch that I bought myself with my own money when I finished, when I graduated from officer school in the army here in Singapore was a great link chronomat, navy blue, steel with the gold rider tabs. And so for me, it's been something that I've always had a nostalgic place for. And for the first time, I can see a chronomat that, okay, now I want to buy one again. You know, so I think that's cool. And then also for the younger guys, it seems like it's a watch that they're very much connecting with as well. Absolutely. It's funny, um, since 25 years, journalists asking me, what is the watch you would take on an island if you had just one watch to take? And I was never able to, to answer. And today I would definitely say the chronomats. And it's the first time I'm convinced about it. why. For, for us, it's an all purpose watch. So it's an all purpose watch for, um, the technical features, you know, with the interchangeable riders where you can do uh, countdown, count ups, you have a tachymeter, uh, and it's waterproof, it's a sporty watch, but from an aesthetic point of view, it's basically something you can wear with everything, with a tuxedo, with jeans, with a more formal suit. Or... So for me, it's the ultimate perfect watch. And if there's one watch I would take on an island, it's this one. I totally agree with you, you know, and you hit, hit something precisely on the head there. Um, I know you put, have put the chronomat uh, within the land category. And initially I was, I was like, oh, well, you know, but it was initially created for the Freccio Tricolore, which is an aviation team. But the more I thought about it, it really is a phenomenal sports sheep watch. You know, it's like a sports sheep integrated bracelet watch that also happens to be truly yeah. and iconically from your past as well, you know? Yeah. No, indeed. I mean, the past, um, we, we, the, the, the product was, of course, and is, this is why we've um, uh, also launched a limited series uh, for the Frecce Tricolore. It was associated to the Frecce Tricolore, but also I, we discovered that in Formula One with Renault at that time, many years back. Uh, but I think it's an all-purpose, as you said, sport chic watch, and it works every day and everywhere all the time. And that's the amazing thing about that product. Oh, I absolutely love it. You absolutely nailed it. And I, and I agree with you, the, my favorite version is the Salmon Dial one as well. I think that's really cool. <laughs> Wearing it. Wearing it. Now let's, let's go from that to um, a icon from Breitling, uh, born in 1957, the Super Ocean Heritage 57. Um, you know, it's funny when you started, uh, when you took over Breitling, I think from, probably from the onset, people probably kept coming up to you and saying, when are you going to do a super ocean like the, like the, like, like the original one? And, and I know that was something you were thinking about, but when you executed it, it really brought a smile to my face because you did it in such a combination of a homage to the past with that beautiful concave bezel, but also in a fun contemporary way also. Yeah. So first of all, and I mentioned that several times, me and many others know Breitling's recent history, let's say the last 20 years, which is very much big watches, polished watches, bulky, etc. And then one day, I basically three weeks, something like three weeks after I joined Breitling, I met with a gentleman called Fred Mandelbaum in Austria, who is one of the biggest collectors of chrono graphs in the world and by far the most knowledgeable person on Breitling. And I walked into his office and I uh, came and I saw a table as big as this boardroom table, huge, and there were hundreds of pieces on the table. Hundreds of pieces. I f way I felt out of my shoes, I'm telling you. <laughs> I saw one piece more beautiful than the other, and I picked something like 10, 15 pieces. By the way, the Navi 865, uh, the Avi, uh, 765, which we did as re edition, the top time, you know, with the Zorro face, the Super Ocean Heritage 57, and many more, which I cannot tell you now. Many more, many more. Sure. Um, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I thought, oh my God, these watches are amazing. These watches are amazing, and they're so, so, so cool. And I shared it with my son, who is, a, who is, an arch, who is a studying architecture at uh, Royal Island School of Design. And these guys know, you know, these young kids know. And, and they said, oh, my God, this is the one I want. Which is amazing because you're talking about a kind of a retro watch. But this is what cool people today are looking for. So the product, you're right, 
has been executed in a classic way. It, by the way, with a new mesh strap, which is now fully integrated into uh, the case. So it's round and not straight like the super ocean heritage as we have, have it today. And um, we kept it flat. I mean, there were many discussions. Why don't you do 200 meters, etc.? But first of all, I'm a diver also. I, I, the, the deepest I dive is 35 meters. Anyway, that watch is primarily certainly not done to be a hardcore diving instrument. It's, 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 a, it's an homage to the past and to have a cool product. Um, and, um, and so we have these leather straps and we have these beautiful classic executions, which are amazing. And then we, Sylvain, by the way, my designer had that idea of, of, of the rainbow. And then we it. looked at it, we looked at it and then we said, oh my God, we have the Econil straps, you know, the colored straps, which perfectly fit the colors of the hands. And then we've put it on uh, some beautiful breasts of beautiful uh, women and colleagues at Breitling and they felt in love with it. So we have the classic Super Ocean Heritage 57 uh, for men and women. And then we have, I would say, a more colorful execution in 42 millimeters still, uh, which is certainly targeting more women than men and which is very colorful and which is I would say sunshine in uh, the future, in the coming weeks, once we will get out of our confinement. That's exactly why that watch made me smile. You know, the thing is, the thing I've appreciated most in, in during this period is, is, you know, when I was growing up, you were either, either a Rolling Stones guy or a Beatles guy. And for me, I always liked the Rolling Stones because I thought they were cool. You know, I like the swagger. I like the fact that they were all, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, they had all the, cool, the great looking girls like Marianne Faithful or Jerry Hall. And for me, the Beatles were always a little bit, I don't know, uh, maybe too tame. But in the last uh, couple of weeks, I have to tell you, I've been listening to the Beatles so much because we all need positivity, we all need hope, and we all need unity. And when I saw this rainbow uh, Super Ocean 57, it was almost as if you had intentionally created a symbol that is the most needed watch at a time like this. So I have to say, it made me smile, and everyone I know saw it, um, it made them smile too. So, you know, bravo. That's very cool. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the Nava Timer 35. Really cool watch. Um, I, I, you've got some amazing ambassadors. Uh, tell us about how you took a icon of uh, pilot's uh, watches and made it something that is suitable for a woman to wear also. Okay, let me, let me say three things. The first thing is that Breitling was very strong in female watches end of the uh, 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, in particular with the Galactic, but more in sports watches, not in elegant watches. Um, the second thing is 60% of the market, of the whole watch market, are females, are women's watches. So the market is bigger than the market for men. Third, what is missing in the market are more sportier watches. You have many, many elegant watches, and we knew we 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 shouldn't, uh, you know, compete uh, in that context. So when looking at our collection, we launched the Super Ocean last year in the in the, in the ladies size, or relaunched it. By the way, within the Super Ocean collection, which we've redone and which has been growing like hell, the single must performing reference is the wide dial lady size the number one reference now we have the orange dial and the blue dial and they're all doing well so super sport now we have a sports elegant ladies line and later this year you will have a sports ladies line the beauty of the super ocean of the navi timer um, 35 is, uh, is, is, is manifold. First of all, the aesthetics, because you have also concave dial, so you have a wide opening, whilst it's only 35 millimeters, and it works very well on smaller and on bigger wrists. So that's number one. Then you have a particular aesthetics with these um, uh, pearl uh, bezel, which uh, we all know from the Navi Timer 806, which is a clear identity also of the Navi Timer. And we wanted to keep the uh, identity, of, identity of the Navi Timer with the sliding rule and with the printing on the dots, but 
in in uh, in um, in being less less crowded, but keeping that sportivity uh, element in that product. So you have here a fantastic product, um, clearly different from what you have in the market. Sports elegant, which is totally com uh, complementary to the Super Ocean, uh, and which will be totally uh, complementary to the new ladies line, which is more sporty, which is coming out um, at the end of the year. Fantastic. George, you mentioned the, uh, the beautiful signature bezel of the 806 Navitimer, and I really love this homage piece that you did. I think in collaboration, I think you had uh, our friend Manfred, or Watchfred as he's known on Instagram, helping you out on this. Earlier this year, you came out with an absolutely magnificent piece, a bit in this vein also, the 765 ABI. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Because that's such a cool watch. I think this is, again, you know, when I saw these products, you, you choose by heart. You know, you, you see something and you say, oh my God, this is so beautiful. But the AVI uh, 765 is a classic of, um, of writing uh, of 1953. Um, it has inspired many other brands uh, later on. It's, the, it's one of the absolute ultimate uh, early days uh, pilot's watches. And, um, and I think that's the point of genius. You were talking about the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. When you listen to the songs today, they're still great. Even the songs of the 70s and 80s and 60s, they're still great because it's genius. And you have some designs in the watch industry which are just genius, which are brilliant forever. And the, uh, the Avi is brilliant forever. Um, and that, and the Navi, also 806. And we have a couple of these designs, and I didn't even know when I joined Breitling. I had no clue about it. And uh, trust me, it's a great, it's a great uh, surprise, which is also very helpful, I would say, for business. Fabulous. And the last watch I'd love to talk to you about is the wonderful Top Time that was launched just previous to this, this recent launch. Yes. First of all, I think that in modern age, in a digital age, you need to constantly keep up the dialogue with the consumer and, and not have one period or one week per year where you present new products, etc. And then it's like a souffle, it's going down and, and, and at a certain stage you get the product. Today, I think you need to have different uh, launches during the year and uh, basically offer um, creativity, animation to a very uh, digital oriented uh, consumer. And we will always have during the year single products, uh, single, single executions like the top time um, to surprise the consumer. Um, and um, in, in particular also to animate all the uh, digital uh, channels, even though on demand that product is also available with our uh, retailers. And I just love the design. I saw as, as this was one of these designs I discovered with Fred. I saw it, I said, oh my God, that's so different. And it's about aesthetics uh, in combination with differentiation, uh, uniqueness. And I think uh, you have here coolness factor, which is also great. And it's important in a digital age, in, an, in, a, in a period which is difficult, that people also have anchors into the past, but in a very cool way, not in a dusty, old way. We don't want to be old. We want to be cool and, and funky. And uh, many things are cool and funky uh, uh, at Brightling and, and uh, which we can uh, use and, and uh, also tell our stories. Absolutely. George, you know, I, this, th this leads us to the next conversation I wanted to have with you. You said, which I believe you are completely correct in, is that a lot of times about 70% of the opinion about a watch is formed from a digital impression. And I totally agree with you. From the moment that a watch image is shared, in one millisecond, it's around the world. And what will happen shortly afterwards, and it usually takes maybe less than six hours, is for a consensus opinion to form. We saw this yesterday with after your launch of the chronomat. By the time I went to sleep, 
Um, you know, so I was launched at 8 p.m. my time here. By the time I went to sleep at midnight, there was a consensus, and the consensus was extremely positive. You know, so for you, do you think? And and also, I also believe in what you said that the rhythm in which we we launch watches should be one that happens over the course of the year, so people can process and digest it and appreciate it. Do you feel for both of these reasons that the traditional watch fair is anachronistic? As you've seen recently, there's been a huge exodus from Basel. Um, to, to come back on these regular launches, I think what is one of the key elements of today is that it's, it's this concept of from catwalk to the store or from catwalk or the presentation to the wrist. Okay, you cannot have launches or presentations of products which are not available. I mean, you can wait a couple of weeks, you know, but not months. And um, uh, and, and therefore having, it's very, it's impossible basically because of the supply chain, because of problems, et cetera, to have one specific date, uh, believing that you can uh, basically um, um, then cover the whole year. The, the world doesn't uh, work like that. Uh, people want it here and now, you can take it positively or not, but you have to be much more uh, imminent in, in, in presenting and shipping as uh, the product. The, the, second, the second point is in a, in, in a world of mobility, not now, but in the past and most probably back in the future, you know, we have daily contacts with our retailers. I see them every day. Uh, we present the products. We have been presenting all these products before Corona and even in Japan in so many countries during Corona, while this was possibly possible. Uh, in, in the context of the restrictions. So that's one, you know, talking to the retailers is one thing. Talking to the consumers and to the press is another thing. Uh, so we need more preparation for the retailers, but I like to see them, to discuss it, to have an interaction. These are our partners. As you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I need to take care um, uh, uh, from, uh, with, with, with our retailers. Whilst when you present it online, boom, it has to be available like the Navitama will be, or in, in May, the Konomat will be. So yes, uh, we need to have a much more flexible, I think, format for all the watch brands. And, uh, and I think spread during the year. And we have been leaving Basel two years uh, ago already. Um, of course now, and this is great, uh, you have a gathering during a certain period of time of the family, you know, in Geneva, it's a kind of family feeling which is great and everybody will have to define what presence uh, uh, the brand should have in Geneva during this, I would say, big uh, family uh, gathering, but for other reasons than selling watches. So for example, Brainling might have a community related event during this period. Whatever, we haven't uh, thought about it and it's all new. We need to talk to everybody to find out and, um, you know, think about it. Uh, I, I cannot answer. Um, I think our fundamental decision not to have booths and, and I mean, also financially, you know, we, we affair is very expensive, is very intense. Okay. And we saved a lot of money in a way also with our summits. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had to cancel the summit, you know, and we did a webcast, which probably cost 5,000 uh, Swiss francs. The point is we had as many uh, digital and, and press coverage with 5,000 than with 5 million we yes. spent in Basel. Exactly yes. the same, exactly the same coverage, even more, even more because we were alone. And uh, on the other side, we're talking to our retailers anyway uh, during the year and uh, they've seen the products. As I said, we were lucky enough to present it before Corona. So um, there are different reasons why you are, you know, you would be in Geneva or not, et cetera. And, and, and we need to think about, yeah, the reason why and what it can add, I think, to the industry um, and what formats will be used or will be, um, you know, yeah, will be used there. Amazing. Two last questions, George. And I, George, I love the fact that you asked the opinion of your son who's studying to be an architect at uh, the Royal Island School of Design, otherwise known as RISD, which is probably the best school in the world for this. But it's interesting also because I think he's Generation Z, if I'm not mistaken. 
And Generation Z, um, for them, they're different from the people that, uh, that, that you know, are from our generation or older. And it's very interesting, every time we have someone come in to intern, one of the first questions he asks is, what are the ethics of your company? And I love the stance that you've taken with Breitling also, in particular related to the ocean and related to creating uh, straps that are made from 100% recyclable material in terms of the ethical approach. Do you think that part of the um, process of having gone through this, having been in isolation, understanding that we, everything we do has an effect on the planet and the human beings that are here, um, it will impart upon the entire industry, the luxury industry, the idea that you have to be careful about your ethics also. I think this is something we have been discussing since long time, uh, Vey, and, 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 and um, there are two things. I think, first of all, the values of our society and of the consumers. And um, I think it's even more important after Corona than before, but it started before Corona. Um, people and the young generation, they want to deal with meaningful brands, brands with purpose. They want indeed sustainability. Um, and what was cool in the past might not be cool in the future. And by the way, what was uncool in the past might become very cool in the future. So the values totally changed. Um, I read somewhere that the bio um, nutrition aliment, uh, alimentation is booming, increased by 25% of the last couple of weeks. So uh, perhaps the vegetarian or the vegan guy uh, who was looked in a weird way 10 years ago, whilst other people were eating a big steak with sauce bernaise, etc., it's reversed now. What car? and excessive luxury will you be able to buy in the future without looking embarrassing um, today and shocking for people was probably there would be a huge unemployment in the world um, and there are some things which you cannot just do anymore and i think the consumer behavior uh, changed already with a new generation. They have other values than uh, my generation. And I think it's great. And we engage into this ocean conservancy and working with people like Kelly Slater um, and with their commitment, with the Econeo straps, etc. even before Corona. But everything what we have, and you know we want to be carbon neutral, uh, and we have many initiatives uh, going on in that sense. I think it's super important um, to, to do this. The second thing is I think luxury is becoming more and more informal. The new generation, the new generation is much more informal than the older one, meaning you don't know uh, if this kid is not a, a, a multimillionaire because he just created a, a startup. Um, and I think that the, the partners we have, like Kelly Slater uh, or like the Triathlon Squad, these people, it's more accessible to the, to the real consumer than eventually Formula One or golf, which represents more the traditional uh, luxury and consumption and clients. And um, both in... Um, values and behavior and expectations, I think the world is changing. And I'm very happy because we did it intuitively that we have been on that path um, uh, since, since uh, we took over the brand in the way we do our boutiques, you know, with our pool tables, with our bars, the way we do our advertising campaign, you know, with cool and relaxed people, Brad Pitt, Adam Driver, um, you know, Kelly Slater, etc. We have cool and relaxed people and the whole expression of the brand is, is, is less formal and traditional than in the rest of the watch industry. And all this with the design umbrella of being, you know, modern retro, I think that um, gives us uh, lots of potential um, um, in, that, in, in this moment in time. Amazing. Last question for you, George. And, you know, initially when I came into quarantine and then isolation, 
I, like uh, I think a few other people, sort of let myself become a little bit less structured with my day. And that was a very big mistake because you become depressed as a result of this. So what I had to do was to reintegrate structure in a very strict way, meaning waking up at a certain time, exercising for a certain amount of time, exercising your mind for a certain amount of time, processing information, then having all of my different meetings with my teams, you know, uh, that are internationally. And I find myself to be even more busy now somehow than, than I was before. And what is amazing about this is that in this instance, the watch has somehow become even more relevant to me, particularly chronographs, because I use them when I'm timing sports. Am I doing my HIT interval training? I need a chronograph. You know, if I give myself an hour to write an article, okay, now I'm gonna have this, or an hour for lunch. I compartmentalize my day, and my watch, all, or my watches have somehow become even more relevant to me. Do you think after we get out of all this, people are still gonna love mechanical watch making? I think traditional watch uh, making um, will be even more relevant uh, in the future. It will uh, coexist with the digital watches, but they represent a different life. They represent traditional craftsmanship. They uh, represent uh, history. Uh, in a way, they represent the good old days reassurance uh, and if you do it smartly uh, it represents coolness and um, and i said that several times analog watches are the new luxury uh, in a world which probably slowed down i think we will travel less in the future suddenly everybody's using the zoom meetings etc team meetings and all that stuff um, and uh, by the way i opened the bracket i've been having these meetings with all the retailers worldwide over the last two weeks. So we have always, always groups of 25 retailers, you know, uh, East Coast, West Coast, Central USA, then the Italians, et cetera. And um, it's incredible. They love it. And, they've, and we've basically agreed that we'll keep that conversation at least twice a year with everybody, you know, in, in smaller groups to talk, to exchange, to listen, okay, what's going on in China? When are you, what product works, blah, blah, blah. So it's amazing how suddenly um, these tools actually um, intro introduces a new relationship to your retailers and to your consumers. I've been doing for the first time, you know, live interviews on Instagram and, and et cetera, et cetera. And the reactions are great. Of course, people are confined and they have time and they attend all this stuff. But still, it's very convenient, and, and you know all these jokes about uh, which we all got on our WhatsApp, etc. Uh, who is in charge of your digital transformations? Is it the CEO, the CEO, or COVID nineteen? Of course, it's COVID nineteen, and this is a milestone in uh, in I would say broaden uh, the digital transformation in 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 every household, in every every uh, everybody's life. Still, I'm very happy then when. All this will be over when we'll be able to see each other again because we are species humankind is a species which is which is social so we need that that contact and everybody will be happy but perhaps this will slow down a little bit also the um the stress in in our lives because we can do these kind of of meetings and uh, without you traveling to uh, europe or me traveling to singapore um, with the same impact. Um, and as I said, yesterday with our webcast, we reached as many people as we did for, uh, and even more than we did in a week in, uh, in, in Basel. So um, I think analog watches, if marketed and communicated in the right way, have a phenomenal future. Absolutely. It's a great product because it's also an ethical product. It endures forever and it only consumes the energy given by the human being wearing it, also like a bicycle. And to my bicycling buddy, George Kern, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and you're a great person to speak to and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to everybody. Thank you, George.